Pussy Riot, was founded in 2011, but shot to greater prominence after appearing in Moscow's Cathedral of Christ the Savior in February of 2012 to perform an obscenity-laced song called Punk Prayer, which attacked the Orthodox Church's support for President Vladimir Putin. Russian protest group Pussy Riot have been beaten with horse whips by Cossacks who are helping patrol Sochi during the Winter Olympics. Footage shows members of the band, which became famous after performing a protest song in a church against President Vladimir Putin being beaten. Police questioned witnesses, but no one was arrested. On Monday, two band members were arrested on suspicion of theft at Sochi, but later released. The footage shows Narazia Tolakominikova and Maria Alakohina, who both served prison sentences for their Moscow church performance, being attacked along with other band members. A Cossack appears to spray a substance in the face of one of the band members who are wearing ski masks. An officer with a whip then proceeds to attack the band members along with members of the media. Other Cossacks then jump in, punching band members and throwing them to the ground. Several weeks after the cathedral stunt, which was broken up by church officials, Maria Alakohina, Yaka Tarina Samusovic and Nadzida Tolokonakova were arrested and charged with hooliganism motivated by religious hatred. So the girls from Pussy Riot and a guy who was taking part in a performance that they were trying to do, uh, they just walked out of a restaurant, walked up to a big sign that said Sochi on it, started putting their masks on, and a bunch of Cossacks came out of nowhere and just started beating them up. Somebody sprayed pepper spray, they got their whips out. It was pretty serious. Now the police have showed up, but the police are refusing to arrest anybody who was involved in beating them up. А почему вы не арестовали никого? Уважаемый, я не могу давать никаких комментариев, все на советскую четыре улицы, пресс-центр. Now they're saying that the Cossack who drew blood has been arrested, but nobody saw him get arrested and he's not here anymore. They were held without bail until their trial in late July, when they were convicted and sentenced to two years in prison. Smatsuvic was freed on probation in October of 2012, but Tola Kohova and Alakohina remained in jail. The case divided Russia, with many feeling the women were being too harshly treated and made examples of as part of an attempt to clamp down on opposition to the government, but others felt their actions were a gross offense to the Orthodox faith. The trio's fate attracted much international attention. Musicians like Sting, the Red Hot Chili Peppers, Madonna, and Yoko Ono called for their release, while human rights groups designated them prisoners of conscience. Pussy Riot's distinctive colored balakavas became a widely recognized symbol. The women, both mothers of young children, faced tough conditions inside Russia's prison system and had a number of parole requests turned down. Tola Konakova, she's the one on the left, complained of abuses by prison staff and went on a hunger strike. The pair's sentences were due to end in March of 2014, 
but their release became inevitable in December after an amnesty law was signed by the Russian parliament, covering at least 20,000 prisoners, including mothers. Mr. Putin's critics see the amnesty as a bid to avoid controversy overshadowing Russia's hosting of the Winter Olympics in February. Maria Alakohina, the first of the duo to be freed from jail, told a Russian TV channel that the amnesty was a PR stunt and she would rather have remained in prison. Tolo Konakova, seen here gesturing as she walked out of a prison hospital in Siberia, said that together with Ala Kohina, she would set up a human rights group to help prisoners. Pussy Riot, Russia Free's jailed band members, the headline read on December 23rd of 2013. Maria Ala Kohina, I intend to pursue a career in human rights. Both jailed members of Russian punk band Pussy Riot, whose incarceration sparked a global outcry, have been released under an amnesty law, Sergei Zakin, BBC Russian Service. As soon as Maria Alakohina stepped through the prison gates, she described the amnesty law under which she was released as a profanation, since it applied only to a minority of convicts. Most pundits see the amnesty as President Putin's attempt to soften his image in the West and improve his human rights record ahead of the Sochi Olympics in February of 2014. Two days after the amnesty came into force, Mr. Putin pardoned Mikhail Khodorkovsky, once Russia's richest man, and his personal foe, in a move that again was widely seen as an attempt to appease the West. The Pussy Riot member's stance appears to be less serene. Ava Kohina's first words and actions after being freed serve as a sign that this fight is likely to get far more fierce and more personal. Nadza Tolakonakova and Maria Alakohina dismissed the amnesty as a publicity stunt before the Sochi Winter Olympics in February. They both promised to continue their vocal opposition to the government. Nothing special. We managed to keep our personal freedom inside even when we were imprisoned. We always wanted to change things around for us for the better, so now we're free. Our work just continues. It's just a different environment. Prison is the place where you feel freedom the most. The freedom is inside you. What should the world know about what it's like to be a prisoner in President Putin's prison system here, and how should they react? I think the world needs to know that there are not many changes in Soviet times. If the Ministry of Justice released a new order, it would be an exact copy of the one from Soviet times. We're going to change this. I want to add that it's not just the two of us who's going to change this. We're going to have a team, a big organization. We already have lawyers who have been helping us and working with us since we were jailed. Now they will also investigate the violations that we recorded. And we're asking Russian citizens to provide us with information of any violations they're aware of to help in this. Changes have begun, but you need to constantly work on them. Russian system is designed in such a way that without social control, it will die immediately. Because the people in the system will try to use every possibility to escape from their obligation and responsibilities. This all came about as a protest against the Russian president. What future do you see for Putin's Russia? And what future do you see for yourselves within that Russia? Of course we'd like to live in a future where there is no Putin system. 
where we'd have a democratic, transparent system with no corruption, with no hatred inside a society that is always provoked against a particular group, like for example, gays or the West. There's too much hatred in this country. We'd like to help it become more humane, but I'm afraid it's impossible with Putin in power. You know what happens to critics of the Russian president. You've been through the hell of what you've just described. Are you not scared of what may happen? No way. We're not afraid of them. They're the ones who should be afraid of us. And now, two years after your performance in the cathedral, what is your message to President Putin? We're making him go away. We were not defeated because we had our own victories over the system. You can't make us silent. If you want to have us in Mordovia, you'll have us there. But it will be the same headache for you, we guarantee you. How will you make up for these lost years in the lives of your children? Do you ever regret what you did? I think we will have a story to tell to our children. I think we will have a story to tell to our children, and our moral choice that we made is the best educational example we could give them. We hope to see changes for the better, just small ones because our children will grow up in this country and we're not going to leave. So the choice that we made was made for our children also. The women were jailed in August of 2012 after performing a protest song in Moscow's main cathedral. The act was seen as blasphemous by many Russians and was condemned by the Orthodox Church. But their conviction for hooliganism, motivated by religious hatred, was criticized by rights groups, anti-Putin activists, and foreign governments. Both Pussy Riot members said their anti-government stance had not softened and both promised to form a human rights group to fight for prison reform. Tola Konakova shouted, Russia without Putin, as she emerged from a prison hospital in the Siberian city of Krasnoyarsk. The 24-year-old said her time in jail had not been wasted, adding, I became older. I saw the state from within. I saw this totalitarian machine as it is. Uh, the first video that actually catapulted them into uh, fame was taped in the cathedral in Russia. Um, they weren't actually supposed to be in there. Uh, I believe the women aren't allowed to be in the cathedral play, uh, praying. And they, um, they went on the stage and performed I believe it was 51 seconds that they performed on there and um, they were quickly escorted out. Um, they were singing lyrics that um, actually stated um, a prayer to Mary. Um, they asked her to take Putin out of the office. I believe that Putin just, you know, couldn't have these women disrespecting the church. So there's a lot of views to it. There's, you know, the people that are um, happy and they are, you know, cheering on Pussy Riot, but then there's the other people that, you know, they, they come from religious backgrounds and they just feel that that is so disrespectful to the church and that they shouldn't be free. Um, it's very controversial and that's the reason why there is, um, there's so much to lose on both ends. Oh. In fact, the day before, Pussy Riot were detained supposedly on suspicion of stealing a woman's purse, but they were released when half of the world's media showed up at the doorstep of the police police station where they were being held. Putin, no. <laughs> 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 
сказали я, я не знаю, вчера публично сказали о нашем аресте, и это вызвало достаточно знаю, большое возмущение. Потому что а, да, да, они существовали, поэтому они больше не действуют на нас через государственных органов. Они воздействуют на нас еще более неправовым методом, чем раньше. Они себя просто натравливают на нас казаков. Безопасности здесь не существует ни для гражданских активистов, ни для политических активистов, ни для тех граждан, которые просто хотят сказать о том, что они не согласны с данной властью. Правительство этого не стесняется, так как об этом практически нет информации. Наша задача сделать так, чтобы эта информация была. Наша задача сказать правду максимально громко. So after their abortive attempt to record a music video by the seaport that was broken up by the Cossacks, they're now going to head out and try to do it again. Well, see, Riot finally managed to do what they've come to the Russian Olympics capital to do and recorded their first protest song since being released from prison. It's called Putin Will Teach You to Love the Motherland. December 12, 2013, Pussy Riot case. Russia to reassess guilty verdicts. Russia's Supreme Court has criticized the guilty verdicts handed down to the two jailed Pussy Riot punk protesters and has ordered a review. The announcement came just three months before Maria Alakohina and Nadia Tola Konakova are due to be released from prison. They were jailed in 2012. The verdict did not include proof that they were motivated by hatred towards a social group, the Supreme Court said. The court also ignored their status as mothers with young children. The pair are serving their sentences in separate penal colonies a long way east of Moscow. The husband of jailed Pussy Riot band member Nahazida Tola Konakova has told the BBC that he has spoken to her for the first time since she went missing 26 days ago. Poulter Vazlov said his wife 
was in prison in a hospital in Western Siberia. He said she was undergoing tests for various conditions at the tuberculosis hospital number one in Krasnorsk. But he added that she does not have tuberculosis. Mr. Velzov said his wife had told him that the conditions at the hospital were much better than at the penal colony in Mordovia, where she had been held previously, and that she had not been beaten during the 26 days she went missing. Russian prison authorities issued a statement confirming that convict Tola Konakova has arrived to the institution of the Russian prison service in the Korsniarsk region. A spokesman said her exact location had been sent to her lawyer, who had instructions not to tell anyone else. It also speaks to a larger issue of a general response in Russia to this case, where you know a majority of people were against them and felt that they got what they deserved. So there was this sense that yeah, this you should there should be a public spanking of these people, and that we're going to broadcast it and show it. And there as well, there are television shows that you see in the film that show how they were vilified to a large extent. And one of the purposes for making the film was to show, especially Russian audiences, that you know, that these women are real patriots and they're very nice people and they are idealistic and are acting on behalf, they're interested in the future of their country and doing all these things. Where, what's, what's going on with them now? Well, you, sorry, well, Katya was released on appeal in October mm -hmm. um, and Masha and Nadia are still in their various labor camps. The two moms. The two mm -hmm. moms, yeah. In fact, Masha last week went on a hunger strike in protest against certain mm -hmm. conditions, so it's pretty tough. I mean, uh, they, you know, they, obviously they're separated from their five-year-old kids, one boy, one girl. Yes. And, and they're so continuing their legal battles, so they're filing various appeals with um, with their lawyers as well for early release, and none of them have been successful thus far. Yeah. Well, in watching the film, you know, their attitude, even in the courtroom, you know, they just, they don't compromise. Um, and so I imagine they're not compromising in prison and, and they're not falling no. into the docile sort of, no. uh, I'm sorry, please forgive me position that probably would speed their release. That's right, and, and Nadia got into trouble uh, recently because she refused to take part in the prison beauty pageant. Uh, which she obviously could have won quite easily. Uh, yeah, it's things like that. I mean, they are being, you know, they're still being harassed ultimately. And, and as you say, they are absolutely irrepressible. I mean, you see this in the trial. They, and they dominate the proceedings. They control the whole court. They're, they're the ones ultimately in control and use the court really as a form of performance themselves. Yeah, you know, they're, they're I mean, yeah, and, and, and you know, from, uh, for us, I think that dramatically in terms of telling the story, that's the, almost the most interesting thing is that you know, they, they didn't necessarily mean to offend people, but for them, the big challenge, the big dramatic challenge as characters is to, to hold fast to their beliefs and to their opinions and to the fact that they, even if they didn't mean to offend people necessarily, they do believe in their right to do this to what they did, their belief in this kind of art, that it has validity, that it should be allowed, that it's not something, that it's not a criminal offense. And so walking that line between getting their message across and then also saying that no, this is not what we meant, we were, this, this shouldn't be classified as a hate crime, which is what it was. The administration of IK-50 prison in the middle of Taji Virgin Forest told us today, we don't have Tona Konakova here and don't know when she will arrive, he said, adding 19 days without any contact with Nadia. July 26, 2013, on Wednesday, Amnesty International urged the Russian authorities to give information about Tolo Kornikova's whereabouts and said she must be allowed to see her lawyer. A second member of the Russian punk protest group Pussy Riot has had her application for parole denied. A court in Sharansk ruled that Nadzia Tola Konakova had not repented for her crime of hooliganism after singing a protest song against President Vladimir Putin in Moscow's main cathedral. A similar ruling was delivered against Maria Alakohina on Wednesday. Both women are due to be released from their penal colonies next year. Both are eligible for parole already. They were turned down earlier this year and immediately appealed. The jailing of the two women and of Yakarina Smutsevich, who had her sentence suspended, 
and was freed in October caused outrage worldwide. Critics accused the Russian authorities of punishing the women for their boisterous protest against the policies of Mr. Putin in the run-up to his re-election as president. They were convicted of a breach of public order motivated by religious hatred for their performance of punk prayer inside Christ the Savior Cathedral in February of last year. While Pussy Riot grabbed attention of the worldwide press, they are by no means the only opposition to Vladimir Putin that have come under government ire and detention. Russian anti-corruption blogger and opposition politician Alex Nalvani has been jailed for five years for fraud after a trial he says was politically motivated. Mr. Nalvani could now be barred from running in the Moscow mayoral election set for September. He also joins a growing list of opponents of President Vladimir Putin who have ended up on the wrong side of the law or in exile or have met their deaths under suspicious circumstances. When Mr. Putin first became president in 2000, he immediately set about curbing the power of the oligarchs, the group of billionaires who exerted huge influence over Russia's political system and its media. His first victim was media magnate Vladimir Gusinsky, the owner of NTV, a station that at one time was highly critical of Moscow's war in the breakup Republic of Chechnya and was home to the satirical puppet show Kuki, which mercilessly mocked the new president. When Mr. Guzinski refused to allow the Kremlin to influence NTV's editorial policy, he quickly found himself charged with fraud in June 2000 and fled the country shortly thereafter. Within months, he was joined by his fellow media magnate and political fixer, Boris Berezovsky. Mr. Berezovsky is believed to have played a key role in helping Mr. Putin into power in 2000, but he quickly fell out of favor with the new regime and sought refuge in the UK. Mr. Berezovsky continued to plot against Mr. Putin and to be held up as a boogeyman by the Russian media until he was found dead in the bathroom of his Berkshire home in March of this year. Police have said that there is no evidence of anybody else being involved in his death. Political opposition to Mr. Putin is becoming an increasingly risky business, with numerous activists facing charges or prison. Two members of the feminist band Pussy Riot are serving two-year prison sentences for hooliganism motivated by religious hatred. Meanwhile, criminal charges of affray, incitement to violence, and assaulting police officers are pending against more than 20 activists involved in disturbances and demonstrations in Moscow on the eve of Mr. Putin's inauguration as president for a third term in May of 2012. I'd like to uh, talk about the uh, trial and jailing of uh, Pussy Riot, that uh, punk group band. Uh, there's been much criticism that the sentence handed down was too strong, was too much, and, and the, the, the whole case was just made too, too, too big a deal of. In fact, it actually backfired and it's brought more people to their cause with the publicity. With hindsight, so it was a beautiful thing, but with hindsight, do you think um, that the case could have been handled differently? Could you please translate the name of the band into Russian? Pussy Riot, the punk band. I don't know what you call it in a Russian, sir. Maybe you could tell me. <laughs> Can you translate the first word into Russian? Or maybe it would sound too obscene. Yes, I think you wouldn't do it because it sounds too obscene, even in English. I actually thought it was referring to a cat, but maybe I'm missing a point here. But anyway, sir, do you think that the, that the, that the case was, was handled wrongly in any way? Could some lessons be learned? I know you understand it perfectly well. You don't need to pretend you don't get it. It's just because these people made everyone say their band's name too many times. It's obscene, but forget it. Here's what I would like to say. I have always felt that punishment should be proportionate to the offence. I am not in a position now and would not like in any way to comment on the decision of a Russian court, but I would rather talk about the moral side of the story. 
First, in case you've never heard of it, a couple of years ago, one of the band's members put up three effigies in one of Moscow's big supermarkets, with a sign saying that Jews, gays and migrant workers should be driven out of Moscow. I think the authorities should have looked into their activities back then. After that, they staged an orgy in a public place. Of course, people are allowed to do whatever they want to do, as long as it's legal. But this kind of conduct in a public place should not go unnoticed by the authorities. Then they uploaded the video of that orgy on the internet. Then they turned up at Yelokhova Cathedral here in Moscow, causing unholy mayhem, and then went to another cathedral and caused mayhem there too. You know, Russians still have painful memories of the early years of Soviet rule, when thousands of Orthodox, Muslim, as well as the clergy from other religions were persecuted. And so in general, I think the state has to protect the feelings of believers. I will not comment on whether the verdict is well grounded and the sentence proportionate to the offence. These girls must have lawyers who defend their interests in court. They have the right to file an appeal and demand a new hearing. But it's up to them. It's just a legal issue. It's crazy to think that one person can have so much power over Russia, but uh, they only shot 51 seconds of this video that they were actually lip singing to. They, they weren't actually even singing in the cathedral. Um, they were lip singing and um, we have footage. There's footage that you can actually see on YouTube still, even though it's banned in Russia. Um, you, can, you can see the footage and you can see the security guards throwing them out and basically, you know, whipping them for giving their thoughts, for speaking, for a freedom of speech that we lucky Americans have and take for granted. Um, there's also a video of them outside. Um, it's kind of, it's kind of uh, outrageous if you think about it because there's like this smoke in the air and um, they're wearing these ski masks, which they usually do in all of their videos. They're Bright colors are different, and um, they're in tights. They're, it's not provocative. At least I don't think it's provocative, but I might have a different view on that. But um, they have their eyes cut out and their mouths cut out, and um, they're they're speaking for the unspoken people, and that's what that's what they're all about. That's what they want. They want their children to grow up in a civilized country. They want those rights for them. They don't want them to grow up in their ways. Russia is actually known as a dictatorship now because of the way that they're handling these artists. They're punk, ba punk band artists. And to think that those people well, to think that musicians have that much influential power is just something that makes you want your voice to be heard more of. And you want to go ahead and use that right for something that you stand in and that you believe in. Shirad means to develop women, feminists, uh, and it, it means that women are up with the sexist regime, with the situation, uh, with this uh, political system, uh, and with, with religion at the same time, with our uh, Christian church, yeah, and so this means who's right. It's uh, the main conception, the main, uh, one of the main ideas in the group, to be um, anonymous. Yeah, to be anonymous. So and, uh, that's why we're there more masks. Uh, yeah. And why the bright colors? Uh, because we're... We're bright! <laughs> yeah, yeah. But when I put on my mask, uh, I don't feel like a person who can do everything. Of course, I'm the, I'm the same person, but uh, but this is another part of me, uh, which have more courage and uh, which wants, which has strong feeling that uh, what she's doing is right and uh, she has uh, enough power to change something, enough, enough strength. Is it like being a superhero? Then? You have your uh, own yeah, it's, it's like uh, being a Spider-Man. Or a Batman. Or, or Superman. Catwoman. Yeah. <laughs> really? You yeah. put on your mask? Yeah. 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 yeah.
не здоровится, потому что все время считают, что не здоровится, это как бы защитница России, то есть это ну, как бы... И поэтому это была молитва не здоровится о том, чтобы она прогнала Путин, как бы изменил нашу политическую систему. The changes in the government and the, uh, the most important details of Putin. Uh, he is very afraid of people. Really, really afraid of, because uh, they don't like them, they don't support them. Uh, I suppose that no support doesn't support them, but uh, they don't show, um, show their, their opinion, uh, their, their feeling about uh, it, because some of them think that no, not, nothing will, will change. We can show that it's not so scary to do something, and uh, that uh, uh, actions are changing the situation. It's really a very big problem that uh, the Russian society is very patriarchal and um, uh, we believe that uh, Russia needs um, uh, some feminist uh, movement, some... Um, uh, <laughs> feminist list. <laughs> whip. Hmm? It's called a whip. Whip. Uh, so Russia really needs some feminist whip. You have to go home and find your balaclava. Oh uh, yeah, kind of. Uh, or it's it's like Batman. You always have it with you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's kind of Russian super Russian Russian version of, of being superhero. Maybe some some day something will uh, make a movie about Pussy Riot. The widely distributed video of a beating incident, which left three Pussy Riot band members hospitalized has raised questions about the role of the Cossack militia in Russia. At least 10 Cossack militia members and other security officers beat members of the Russian punk band on Wednesday in Sochi, the Associated Press reported. Cossack's identity is rooted in a 16th century Russia when peasants in the Moscow area were forced to work for lords in settled colonies. These peasants fled to the steppe the grassland in the south and formed their own colonies, said Catherine Meridale, a history professor at Queen Mary University of London and author of Red Fortress, History and Illusion of the Kremlin in an interview with USA Today Network. The Cossack culture was warlike and proud, Meridale said. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries of the Tsarist regime, Cossacks fought alongside the Russian armies, Meridale said. They were regarded as the most fierce and most talented horsemen. International Olympic Committee spokesman Mark Adams said he found the pictures and videos of the attack on the Russian punk band Pussy Riot very unsettling, but characterized it as a civic issue, not an Olympic one even though the band performed in front of the Olympic rings in downtown Sochi on Wednesday. Adams said the governor of Krasnodar region has expressed regret about what happened and is looking into the issue. It's largely an issue for the Krasnodar government and he expressed strong disapproval of what happened, Adams said. <laughs> Усирает. Одной из наших самых главных мыслей было то, что музыкант должен нести социальную ответственность. When we first started Pussy Riot, one of our central thoughts was that a musician must bear social responsibility. Как говорила одна из наших солисток Гараджа, музыка должна петь не только о солнце и о любви. As one of our singers Гараджа said, music must sing not only about sunshine and love. Но и о политике, и о тех людях, которые сидят за решеткой, и эм, о тех людях, у которых нет голоса, как <coughs> мы сейчас еще слышали, э, это невероятно важно. И для нас большое счастье, что эту идею с нами разделяет огромное количество музыкантов. We, we must also sing about politics. We must sing about people who are behind bars. We must sing about people who don't have a voice. And this is very important, and we're glad that so many musicians share our view. И чтобы не быть многословными, мы встретимся в концерте. We don't want to go on for too long right now, so we'll see you at the concert.
Thursday morning, the group re-emerged at a news conference outside of a hotel in Adler. The press conference coincided with the release of their new music video, which included footage from Wednesday's altercation. Adams said the IOC requested more details from the Sochi 2014 organizing committee regarding the COSAC incident, but felt confident that the Olympic Charter was being respected. I would purely say that it's a shame if the Olympics is used as a political platform. And that's what we've always said, Adams said. We saw yesterday the strong feelings on both sides that these sorts of things provoke. And that's why we ask that the Olympics not be used as a platform for people to express views, and we will continue to say that. Carol, Pussy Riot, will Vladimir Putin regret taking on Russia's cool women punks? Carol Cadwadler wrote in The Observer, the feminist collective hit the headlines when three members were arrested after an anti-Putin protest. Now, they face up to seven years in jail, a prospect that has shocked and radicalized many Russians. On the eve of their trial, some of the women speak exclusively. For two very full, very long days in Moscow, I have talked constantly to people about Pussy Riot, about how, back in February, three young women from a feminist punk rock band sang a song in Moscow's Cathedral of Christ the Savior how they were arrested, imprisoned, refused bail, and now face up to seven years in jail. How the orders for them seem to have come right from the very top of the Russian government, and how their trial, starting tomorrow, seems certain to become a defining moment in Putin's political career. It is, many people say, practically everybody, in fact, a moment when Russia's future is, in some as yet undetermined way, being decided. At 9 p.m. on Thursday night, I'm at a rally of a couple of thousand anti-government protesters hearing Pussy Riot's name being chanted in the crowd. And I think I have a grasp of the story. It's an astonishing tale of how three young women have brought Putin his biggest political headache yet. A story about art versus power of civil society versus church and state. Or as one filmmaker who's documenting it says, punks versus Putin, he goes on. It's crime and punishment, basically. But there's only a band in jail so far. So it's a bit like The Monkees or a really warped Beatles film. I think I have it sort of clear. And then three hours later, I'm led into the basement in an industrial art space and the story untangles. It becomes not just astonishing, but absurd. Because here are Pussy Riot in their baklavas and brightly colored dresses and tights sitting cross-legged on the floor of a tiny, hot, brightly lit rehearsal room. There, not the three young women in jail, Nadia Tola Konakova and Maria Alkahina, and Yakatrina Smarthujic, or Nadia, Marsha, Katya, as they come to be known. Nobody has been allowed to see them, not their husbands, families, or friends. But Pussy Riot is not just three women. It's a collective of more than 10 women, including two others who performed at the cathedral and are still at large. All of them have vanished since the arrest. They've all gone underground. This isn't surprising, given the danger that they're in. They've spent five months in hiding, waiting to see if they'll be arrested too. And this is their first interview for the Western media. Although they're not the imprisoned women, they don't have to be. That's the intention of the baklavas. They're meant to be anonymous, indivisible, representative, it doesn't matter which of them got arrested. That's the point. That they're not individuals. They're an idea. And that's the thing that has gripped Russia and caught the attention of the rest of the world. That the Russian government has gone and arrested an idea and it's prosecuting 
through the courts with a vindictiveness the Russian people have never seen before. An idea perpetrated by three young, educated, middle-class women, or Davisky girls, as the Russians call them. And it's this that the shock walking into the room, that they're so young, so smiley, so nervous and bashful, and embarrassed at the attention, and not sure how to sit. Pussy Riot aren't just the coolest revolutionaries you'll ever likely to meet, they're also the nicest. They're the daughters that any parent would be proud to have. Smart, funny, sensitive, not afraid to stand up for their beliefs. One of them makes a point of telling me how kindness is an important part of their ideology. They have also done more to expose the moral bankruptcy of the Putin regime than probably anybody else. No politician, nor journalist, nor opposition figure, nor public personality has created quite this much fuss, nor sparked such potentially significant debate. The most amazing thing of all, perhaps, more amazing even than calling themselves feminist in the land women's rights forgot, is that they've done this all with art. How does that feel? It feels like a unique position to be in, but at the same time, it's really scary because it's a great responsibility. Because we are not only doing it for us, we're doing it for society, says the one called Squirrel. The future of Pussy Riot um, to me is, is pretty bright. Um, no matter what the outcome is in the end, whether you know, they do defeat uh, the president of Putin or um, they do, um, in fact, you know, become jailmates for you know, the rest of their lives. Um, they're going to have an effect on Russia, and the world is going to see it. And there's no way that you know this is this is going to end here. There's always going to be somebody rebelling, even if it's you know not them necessarily. I know that uh, there are um, Pussy Riot members amongst us that have not been that have actually gone into hiding because um, their families are very religious and they don't want uh, their um, they don't want to be known by the world uh, but that doesn't hold the fact that they're they're not there um, the future is going to be uh, very tough for them uh, but it seems to me that they uh, are women that stick to their guns and um, they're very intelligent and they will uh, succumb anything that uh, is put against them. I think that uh, people should um, become more aware of um, the, the members besides just looking at them through the outside. You know, there's women that are uh, causing riots, uh, wearing um, these ski masks, uh, baklavas as they're known in Russia. Um, they need to know that these women are chasing their rights and it should definitely be something that I think should be looked up on instead of looked down on. Uh, to all of you that are watching, I would encourage each and every one of you to uh, spend some time on on the website and really get to, to know all of the clips that we have going and track them down on YouTube just so that you can become more aware uh, before you do put any type of judgment on, on this punk uh, group because there is actually a lot um, for a lot of content for people to, to come and appreciate who these women are. They all, um, I know that two of the members have uh, children and they're willing to put their families aside for something that all women will one day become appreciative of. The outfits are cartoonish with bright primary colors, but the masks are just there to shield their faces from recognition. Their anonymity is both symbolic and integral to their entire artistic vision. They all have nicknames, which they say they swap at random. Sparrow, who is 22, Baklava, who is by some way the oldest at 33, and Squirrel, who is just 20 years old. It means that really everybody can be pussy right. We just show people what the people can do, says Sparrow. We show the brutal and the cruel side of the government, says Squirrel. We don't do something illegal. 
It's not illegal. Singing and saying what you think. It's so strange, says Sparrow, seeing Pussy Riot in the papers and on the news and on the internet. You have friends saying, did you see the last action? And you have to say, yes, I saw it on TV. Do your parents know? No, says Squirrel. My dad would kill me. The details are so brilliant. Do you get a call, I ask, when you're out shopping and you have to dash home and put on your bacaba? No, says Sparrow. It's like Batman. You always have it with you, just in case. In conclusion, as this story unfolds, where it ends, how it all ends, is anyone's guess. Cadwalder's words in The Observer offer maybe the best perspective. She concludes, because they are so young, because they have children, because what they have done is so unimportant and silly, and has all of a sudden become so huge because of this disproportionate reaction, because it touches so strangely on so many things. And this is where it becomes an event of almost historic proportions. It touches everything, the church and the state, believers and non-believers, the judge and the czar, and this Russian thing that never ends. For Vision Black Entertainment, I'm Theron K. Cash.